BBOR, Black Box, online radio, coming to you from West Virginia. Today we're still continuing on with our discussion of Madeline McCann, and we've been following the eight-part series that is available on Netflix, The Disappearance of Madeline McCann. But if you haven't heard that yet, feel free to stay tuned and keep listening, because this is not really a film review. We're just having a discussion about the Madeline McCann case. But as you see, though, this is marked number five. I was recently watching the fifth segment that they had on Madeline McCann, and I would have to say that this is kind of very thematic. Like, the first three episodes of the series were really trying to focus on the possibility that in 2007, Madeline McCann was abducted from the resort in Praia de Luz, Portugal. The sort of, um, I say the fourth, uh, the fourth one, the fourth segment, was really trying to focus in on the possibility that perhaps the parents were guilty and that the parents are at actually staged the abduction, that they had fabricated inf information regarding the abduction, and that that was just a blatant lie. And this fifth one here was kind of uh, an examination of just like, is, the, is it possible that the media and the Portuguese investigators, particularly one of the chief in investigators, Gonzalo Amaral, got it wrong, and that the McCann family is not guilty? So what do we make of all this? I mean, I definitely think that they chose to do it this way because it's kind of just following the historical and chronological timeline, but it's also good to just hear different sides of the story, and I think that that is something very valuable, and it's not easy to do in a 40-minute documentary, or definitely not in just like a 15-minute, you know, podcast segment, so like when they have this, um, it's probably under just under eight hours of film about Madeline McCann, you can really just hear the different sides of the story, and I think that that is something very valuable. What do we make of some of the statements, though? Once again, though, I think they had probably about 15 minutes of useless footage in this one. They're just trying to show that the media was vilifying the parents. But in, on the other hand, though, the media was also really trying to vilify the Portuguese investigator Gonzalo Amaral, someone who has promoted nonstop that the McCann family was guilty of something, perhaps murder, manslaughter, or covering up some sort of accident in the apartment that led to the death of Madeline McCann. First and foremost, I would say that Gonzalo Amaral did himself zero favors because they're like trying to explain why there were cadaver dog alerts in the apartment and in, in, in on the rental car that the McCanns had rented. I've talked about the possibility in the past that the McCann family could have found Madeline dead in the apartment at some point during their holiday and then they moved the body to a dump site, perhaps somewhere near the beach. And um, there's even a some there's even someone kind of making a statement about that that they saw Jerry McCann carrying a sleeping girl, a girl who appeared to be asleep, somewhere down the street. Some guy said he was sixty to eighty percent sure that they, he saw Jerry McCann holding a girl like that. And um, I mean I I've heard of this guy before, but I didn't really have too much specific information about him. And it seems like that's all we really have to say. But that's how they introduced uh, episode number five. Is that what happened, that they moved her to a dump site near the beach? Well, Gonzalo Amaral was saying, well, maybe they put her in a freezer. Maybe they put her in a refrigerator. That's what I meant when I was saying that he um, wasn't doing himself any favors. Forget about anything like he's spending his afternoons drinking on the job or something like that. Um, no. I mean, I'm just totally looking for like his explanation about why the kind of cadaver dog alerts came about the way they did is that Madeline died in the apartment and the family put her in a refrigerator or put her in a freezer. He's saying that, but at the same time, maybe we'll learn in parts six, seven, and eight about what's going on with that, but that doesn't sound like kind of the best theory to go for when you don't really have that supporting point. Can you identify the specific freezer that she was kept in? Do you, who helped them get the body to the freezer? I mean, you know, just like, how are you kind of, um, how are you, how are you getting to these conclusions? Like I said, in the first five parts, they didn't reveal anything about that. So it's kind of just like a giant plot hole. Now, one of the things though is I had never heard before that Kate McCann actually made some comments to the media that she thought perhaps that her twins were sedated by the, um, perpetrator who took Madeline McCann because once again though in, we got, you had investigators going in and out of the apartment you had people going in and out of the apartment to look up for Madeline McCann the twins did not wake up for six hours doesn't that sound like they've been given some sort of sedative some sort of sleep aid drug I mean talk about some powerful stuff right 
But um, apparently there was one point where Kate McCann actually made a comment that she thought that that was given to them by the abductor. And I'm like, oh, well, now the tables have kind of turned. First of all, holes in Gonzalo Amaral's theory. But then we also have somebody seeing uh, a person who matches Jerry McCann's description carrying what appeared to be a sleeping girl. And then we have Kate McCann saying that the twins were given possibly possibly given sedatives by the abductor. That's when theories start to get kind of complicated and confusing. And when something is trying to becoming more and more complex, this is something you got to pay attention to in true crime. Once the theories get more and more complex, there is a higher likelihood that they are false. And it's kind of just sort of a statistic. It doesn't mean that it is 100% false, but I would say, though, that the, th the reason why they're kind of coming down hard on Gonzalo Amaral is that he was accused of misrepresenting the story. He was accused of only presenting certain information to the reporters. And, like, this is something that was really kind of emphasized in all the parts of this, all of the first five parts of the series, is that in Portugal, they do not have open information, like, to the police, the police and the press, like, the police can keep stuff secret if they believe it is valuable to their investigation. That doesn't sound controversial, right? Overall, it is not. But um, I was listening to the podcast Crime After Crime that was talking all about uh, Florida man stories, like the reason why we have so many things associated with Florida and the news. And the reason is that Florida has sort of a form of open information where the public can learn all about the kind of workings of the police departments and all of the sort it's kind of like an open information act but it goes by a different name they don't have that in portugal so i mean the police are saying hey we need to protect our investigation so we can't let things go out to the public people are going to learn too much but then on the other hand i mean on the one hand that's completely an honest thing to say okay i don't think that's too far out but on the other hand that created the possibility that people like gonzalo amaral might have been only picking and choosing what they would give to reporters. They might be misrepresenting things. They might be trying to force their own theory. Once again, that's kind of just a reiteration of a point that was made in the documentary. I think it's good, though, to kind of examine, well, as many theories as possible, especially when you're the actual investigators and you're the actual police, the police judiciary in uh, Portugal. I mean, these guys are dealing with the real case. They aren't just talking about it on YouTube. So when you sort of really want to look at it this way, you can see that the media firestorm did go out of control. I don't necessarily think that the uh, series needed to dwell on, like, the kind of different news clippings as much as they did. This tabloid said this, and this tabloid said that, and this tabloid says that Jerry McCann is not Madeline's real father. Who cares? I mean, that's kind of irrelevant. But um, one of the points that was brought up is they believed that they found DNA that was an 80% match to Madeline McCann. In one of the earlier episodes, they said they found DNA from Madeline in the rental car that the McCanns had that was an 80% match. Bear in mind that Madeline should have been... Madeline was abducted 25 days prior to this. So that shouldn't have existed, right? Well, it turns out it's not exactly an 80% match. Maybe it's a 50% match. A Portuguese um, reporter did state that it was a 100% match at one point, but then she's... She came forward and said this was mistaken. Gonzalo Amaral fed false information to the media. But um, they never even completely clarified whether it was an 80% match or a 50% match in the episode. But the whole point is they're trying to say the DNA is ambiguous. It's just like you um, you can't necessarily rule out that that didn't come from a family member. Um, so the point is they don't seem to have any positive DNA that would tie Madeline McCann to the rental car. Another point is the very famous cadaver dog alerts and that we said in the last one. That was like the heart and soul of the upload that we were doing. It look at all these cadaver dog alerts in the cabinet, behind the couch, on the McCann's personal items, on a stuffed plush toy that belonged to Madeline McCann, by the driver's side door. Or actually, I guess, um, I guess this might, maybe this would be the passenger side door, actually, depending on what side of the road they drive in Portugal. Yeah, maybe that would be... I mean, like, I'm American, so of course I think the driver's side is the left-hand side of the car. Okay, it's on the left-hand side of the car. But um, one of the things that they said is just a point that I did not agree with is they're like, well, maybe the dogs are in... Maybe the dogs are fa flawed. There's this reputation out there that the cadaver dogs are infallible. And, well, maybe they just got it wrong. I mean, by cadaver dogs, I mean, there was only one cadaver dog. His name was Eddie. The blood dog was Keela. And I really just thought that that was kind of a minimization of the whole thing. 
I mean, how how necessarily would you explain that? It's like, I would agree that the cadaver dog kind of signaling that there had been a kind of corpse in the apartment at some point is not enough to kind of warrant an arrest or a trial or a conviction. Absolutely, that is not enough evidence. But at the same time, where is it coming from? Moreover, if you do genuinely believe that Madeline was abducted, who took her? I mean, that's one of, the, one of the biggest things. This is a habeas corpus issue, pretty much. Where did Madeline end up? Obviously, that little girl is not present. Well, I mean, like, so I don't think they should be so dismissive of the dog alerts. I mean, is, is it possible that a cadaver dog could get it wrong? Uh, yes, but based on how many different sightings that they had on items that were just no cadaver dog alerts by Sergei Malinka's car, no cadaver dog alerts by Robert Marat's car. These guys didn't have any sort of dog signaling that there had been a dead body in their cars. What about that? And, um, I mean, like, where's that coming from? Not to mention, though, that although Gonzalo Amaral might have had it out for the parents and really might have tried to kind of go after the parents and had not been looking at some other open-minded information, the whole sort of top of seven thing does sound somewhat fishy. And, I mean, it's like, if you look at a very specific individual named Matthew Oldfield, who I don't believe they've um, really kind of examined his story. This is kind of my own just personal note right here. He says that he arrived at 9 o'clock to the tapas bar with the tapas seven. Then Matthew Oldfield goes uh, to check on Madeline McCann. He volunteers to check on the McCann's children at 9.20. He leaves at 9.20 and then he gets there at uh, 9.30 and just looks around. He says very clearly he did not see Madeline. He says he thinks he heard one of the twins rolling over and then he just left. That's also completely bizarre because it's like he went to check on the children but he didn't actually look in the room to see if Madeline was there. I mean, everything seemed fine and quiet. Still though, you went to check on the children but he didn't look in the room to see if just to look at them. Kate McCann says something very similar when she closed the door and the draft slammed it shut without looking in at first. Very suspicious behavior. But the thing I wanted to point out in the timeline is he arrived at 9 o'clock and then he says he wants to leave at 9.20. I don't know. Something, something about that seemed weird to me. The only thing that kind of would answer something like that is if he's like maybe he ordered food at the restaurant and his food hadn't arrived yet or something. But you arrive at 9 o'clock and then you're just you're only staying for 20 minutes before you want to get up and kind of start checking on someone else's children. That sounds extremely bizarre. The whole top of seven thing is bizarre. This system that they created every 30 minutes someone is going to check on their own children. I think that that's weird. And I know we're we've been, I mean, maybe that's an understatement, understatement of the century here, but that's a weird setup they had, especially with the peculiar time frames. It doesn't mean we have to micromanage so so much to the point where one investigator is like, Oh, Jerry McCann said that he was gone for five minutes. He said it took him five minutes to walk somewhere, but it was actually 20 minutes. Mwahaha, we've caught him at a lie. No, people make mistakes. Or sometimes when you're just talking to someone, you don't give the precise time frame. I mean, one time I told somebody I was somewhere for three hours and it was actually 19 hours or something. I mean, people, people say things like that. I mean, you know, it's just like they're just... They're just talking. I don't think we should read too much into these very small micro details. But at the same time, I mean, if there's a major inconsistency with the timeline, we can try and pull that out. But um, th maybe they'll explore some more things about Matthew Oldfield in the coming episodes. However, I just, this top of seven thing is rather bizarre. But one of the points that is brought up in the film is that what did they make of the possibility that seven to nine people can keep a deep dark secret because you know Gonzalo Amaral was pushing that the entire top of seven thing is a forgery it's a fabrication it's fake it's just that um they created this story to kind of hide the death of Madeline McCann and all these people are covering for them I will tell you after following true crime cases in the past normally that doesn't work out and someone comes forward and confesses that's just something that we've seen. It's a consistent thing that's happened in a lot of solved true crime cases, such as the death of Elise Paler, which involved three guys. One of them couldn't take the pressure, and he just confessed. And as well as, like, um, the uh, book Bully, the Ultimate High School Revenge, uh, also made into a movie with uh, Brad Renfro. 
bully the ultimate high school revenge as a title one more time that also deals with like how someone just can't deal with the guilt and such so they confess that is also something that is very normal it is defying probability that seven to nine people could uh hold a deep dark secret like this for as long as they did without somebody confessing once again i mean it's not 100 percent. we're not 100 percent certain but uh, just to kind of recap i think that this film is really downplaying the kind of expert nature of search and cadaver dogs also they can't seem to provide explanations about why robert marat and sergey malinka's car had no cadaver dog alerts when the mccann car did and um as well as other personal items associated with the mccann family while it is true that Gonzalo Amaral might be out to get the parents and might be coming at this from somewhat of a slanted angle. It is also kind of true that we should also view them as someone that does not, they don't need, we don't need to go easy on them because the point is about getting the truth. And even if that is something uncomfortable to hear, like some parents drugged and disposed of the body of their child, then we just, it's about getting the truth. It is almost kind of, that's just the focus of everything. And the top of seven narrative is very bizarre. It is weird. It is abnormal. And I'm I'm just I'm kind of like I find it very confusing. Not to mention some of the other things like the Matthew Oldfield timeline. So those are the points that we would like to kind of be discussing now. If you have anything to say at all, please drop a comment below. I would love to hear from you. What do you think about Madeline McCann? And until next time.